Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope the content encourages you and helps you build your faith. Now enjoy the message. Been in the season, Book of James. Uh, I think we're in like week six of this and we're only halfway through the book, so we've got some work to do. Uh, what you need to know about James, this is very, very important if you're joining us right now, is James was the half-brother of Jesus. Okay? He was not a follower or believer in Jesus when Jesus was on earth. In fact, Matthew chapter 3 tells us that his family came together and his brothers thought he was crazy and they wanted to have him locked away because that's what you do when your half-brother walks around saying he's the son of God, right? Anybody have a crazy half-brother? I've got two of them. I'm blessed. I mean, you're just like, they're nuts. They're out of their minds, right? Imagine your half-brother walking around saying, hey, by the way, I'm the son of God. I'm going to die on a cross for your sins, rise from the dead, and the only way you're getting to heaven is through me. I'm like, dude, shut up. You know, like, quit eating Taco Bell so much. You lost your mind, right? I mean, that, that would be my response, yet that's what happened. And still, as, as not being a follower, James now comes to this point, and we see it in history, where Jesus actually does what he said he was going to do. What changed James' life? Action. Jesus took action. James writes a five-chapter epistle to all Christians. It's been called the, the letter of application, and he basically says, I'm about that action. Will you say it with me? I'm about that action. James says, don't talk about it. I don't care what you have to say. I don't care how well you can articulate it. I want to see you do something. So he writes this letter about action, and in the midst of it, what he gives us over and over and over. So you read the book of James with this lens, with this viewpoint. What is the action my faith should be taking? You will absolutely love the book of James if you read. Go home, read all five chapters this afternoon. Take you 25 minutes with this in mind. What is the action my faith is leading me to take? If you read it that way, you will capture everything that James has to say. By the way, I forgot to say this. I like to say it every week because it makes me feel really good. I know your kids are in the room today, and I want you to know it does not bother me a bit. And it doesn't bother anybody else. We invited kids, family, everyone in. So do me a favor. If my son starts screaming, don't stare down my wife, right? We just don't stare at the parents who have their kids that are being loud. We want them in here. We're glad they're in here. We're so thankful for it. Does not bother us at all. You just got to listen a little harder, okay? But so thankful for kids. It doesn't bother me a bit. July 5 is coming, people. James 3. 1 through 12. No, actually, it's been a real beautiful thing to see parents with their kids in church, worshiping together, dads holding their children while worshiping. I mean, it is just, it's as it should be. So I love it. I'm a, I'm a fan of it. And I'll take the little murmurs and everything else to, to receive that. James 3, 1 through 12. Here we go. You guys ready for this? Ready to tame the tongue a little bit? Come on, you, you got to warm up with me a little bit. One more time about that action. I didn't know you were about to take action today. I'm going to say it. You're going to follow with me. I am about that action. Weak, but all right. Here we go. <laughs> James 3, 1 through 12. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. That one's for me. Number two. For all of us. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire 
by hell itself. Verse 7, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is, a restle- it is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. The New King James says, say it isn't so. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. Say it isn't so. Tell me that's not true. Verse 11, does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. I've got this uh, this lock. Okay, it's it's a great lock. Let me let me tell you a little story about this lock. We in the back of my house, there's a retention pond, and then we have a fence, right? And I wanted access to the retention pond because apparently my neighbor's been catching fish in the thing. I think he's making all this up, but nonetheless, I thought it's there. I want access. So I put a gate in, and when I put that gate in, my kids became fascinated with this gate. Made me really worried. So then I had to get a lock for the gate, so I got this lock, and I put this lock on the gate, And it's been two years, and that lock has started to rust. Every part of it is rusted out, and it's got me concerned because the thought of my kids busting through that rusted lock and going to the retention pond, it's horrifying, right? It's really scary. So uh, I went to Home Depot, and I said, man, I need to buy a lock, and I need a good lock. I need a lock that won't rust. I need a lock that's strong. I need a lock that's tough. So you don't skimp on a good lock. This is anti-rust. This is strong. It can't be cut through. This is all of these things. It's 50 bucks. I was like, dang. They had this $7 one there, but I was like, that, that's probably what would rust. I need the expensive lock. So I bought that tough, big, strong, expensive lock. And then I got home and within 15 minutes, and I know whose fault it is, within 15 minutes, the keys were gone. Gone, searched everywhere, ripped my house apart, trying to, blamed everybody. I preached about anger last week. You want to talk about one of those moments I should have listened to my own sermon? I was like, I know you did this, and I know you did this, and I know you had something to do with it. I was so mad. Man, I was so frustrated. So now it's been three months, and I've still, and I haven't closed it yet because When I close it, then it becomes unusable, but even unlocked, it's unusable. But here's my dilemma. I won't throw it away because then I feel like I'm throwing away 50 bucks, right? And I know the second I throw it away, what's going to happen? Oh, I'm going to find the keys. Going to be in my glove box where they've been the whole time, right? So I can't throw it away. So I've kept a hold of it, but I have it and it's really useless. I can't do anything with it because I don't, it, it's strong. Don't get me wrong. It's strong. And I don't want to buy another one because then you just feel like you're wasting another 50 bucks. So I'm stuck with what I need, but I don't have the key to make it work. Can I tell you something? You may have everything that you need, but the key that's keeping everything from working the way you need it to work in your life is your mouth, your words, the things that you're saying. I I see these strength finders all the time, right? I got the gift of woo, the gift of vision, the gift of communication, the gift of all of these things. I got all these great strengths, right? Or you may be a powerhouse eight on the Enneagram, right? Or all these, all these things that will identify all of your strengths and everything that you have, but it means nothing if you can't control this. It means absolutely, that's what James says. James 3, verse 2, what does he say? Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. I want you to think about that for a second. Because if you could control what's coming out of your mouth, 
you could be perfect. You could fix everything. You could right every wrong that's happening right now. You could correct every sin problem right now. James is saying, you may have all of these wonderful strengths, right? But the key that you have to have to access everything that God wants to do through you is words. Your tongue. The things that you say. Now, hang on. Let me. Anybody else drink to that? Good words. Drink to good words. Cheers to good words. Cheers. I done worship my way out of saliva. All right. Let me settle a confusion for you first. Because when we go to talk about words, here's where a big piece of confusion comes in. This is a theological bedrock that we have to stand on as a church to know exactly what we're talking about. My words do not have creation power. Hear me. This is where theologically words and word of faith and all these things go completely off the rails. My words do not have creation power. One person has creation power with his words, and he spoke the earth into existence. He spoke light into existence. He spoke dark into existence. One person, God, has creation power with his words. The ability to speak. Speak something into existence is creation power. Now, with that, we don't have creation power. We have agreement power. We have the power to agree with what God says and see what God has said and we agree with with our mouth manifest in our life, right? That's what we're talking about when, when we talk about words. We have to understand this. We don't have creation power. I want a million dollars, a red Ferrari in my driveway when I get home. I don't have that creation power with my words. But I have creation power to agree with if I seek first the kingdom of God and everything else, in his righteousness, everything else will be added unto me. I have the power to agree with. That's where when you hear this verse, Proverbs 18, 21, death is and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. What that verse is saying is every time you open your mouth, you are either agreeing with life or you're agreeing with death. You can agree with the life that God has for you. You can agree with the promises that he has for you. You can agree with the truth. You can agree with life or you can agree with death. Let me give you an example. This is agreeing with death. My marriage is dead. That is agreeing with death straight out of your mouth. Here is agreeing with life. My marriage needs resurrection power. My marriage needs, we're saying the same thing, but in one, we're agreeing with death. In other one, we're agreeing with life. So we're, we're saying these things. We have to understand as we tackle words, we're not saying I have creation power with my words. I have agreement power with my words. I can agree with everything that God says about me, with everything he says he wants to do for me, with everything that he wants to do in my life, or I can agree with death, everything the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Question then is simply this, what are you agreeing to every time you open your mouth? What are you agreeing with? What are you coming into agreement with? What are you speaking and agreeing with that is showing up in your life over and over and over? Now, we can jump into James under that understanding. I've got a Father's Day message for you. I want to give you four unbelievable, incredible, remarkable, amazing facts about your mouth today. Does that sound like a real Father's Day? Incredible, amazing, unbelievable, inconceivable facts. These big, beautiful, Ripley's, believe it or not, facts about your mouth. These are the things that we have to understand if we're going to unlock everything else that God wants to do in our life. Because as James said, if you'll you'll fix your words, you can fix everything else. Else. You'll see perfect in every other way. You ready for an amazing fact? Four of you. Are you ready for an amazing fact? 
The tongue has exponential power. Your mouth, your words, your tongue, it has exponential power. It's not powerful, it is exponentially powerful. There is more power in it per square whatever than anything else in your body. Listen to James, James 3, 3 through 5. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing, but makes grand speeches. That's actually a Greek verb for does big things. So what he's really saying is the tongue is a small thing, but it does big things. It's a little thing, but it makes big, exponential, huge impact in your life. James gives us two illustrations, so I don't need to give you one. I'll just use what James says. He says, number one, you can put a bit in the mouth of a horse and control it. My daughter rides horses. In fact, let me show you the progression. Guys, do you have that video of my daughter riding horses? You got it? So, Oh, look. This is how she started out. I used to have to go to Tractor Supply and buy springs for that thing. Like once every two weeks, she'd just bust through the springs, rode it nonstop. This was her first time on a horse. You see the overprotective dad sprinting behind, chasing her head. Like, right? This is her very first time. She had just turned two, so we took her to ride a horse. Look at her. Look at her. Look at her along. She's ready. And then this is her when she's learning to turn the horse, and she's learning to control this thing. Oh, look at beautiful Ginger, right? That's one of the horses that she always rides. And then we have one more. This is her just a couple weeks ago. Look, Ma, no hands. She's got it all figured out. Look at her go. She's just ready. Beautiful, right? Isn't she beautiful? Come on, it's Father's Day. Cheer for my daughter, if you would. So, she was, we were, I was taking her to ride one time, and there's this horse there named Dash. Dash is a retired mall cop. He's not the Paul Blart mall cop. He is this big, bulky, beautiful horse. I am talking massive. He used to work at the Woodlands Mall. He was on patrol out there, and he's just, he was retired and donated to the barn that she rides in, and this dude was real, right? And my daughter, all she wants to do is ride the biggest horse at the barn. Eh, my uncle's a big horse guy. His daughter rides horses all over the country, so get ready, but they always want one bigger and faster. That's like the thing with horses. Where's the bigger one? Where's the faster one? That's what I want. So we show up. She's about to ride Dash, and so I got to check Dash, right, because I'm dad, and my daughter ain't hanging out with no dude that I don't know first, right? So I go up to Dash, and I'm, I'm getting ready to say hi to Dash, and the knucklehead lawn guy is behind Dash and fires up a weed eater right, right as I'm walking up to Dash, and Dash gets startled, and he just rares up at me, and I reached up, and I grabbed Dash by the, no, I took off running, I was like, I am out of here, I'm like, Zion, I hope you're okay, you know, like, Dash has lost his mind, and so then Lauren was like, hey, you know, Zion's gonna ride Dash, and I was like, I oh, know, she's not, you know, and she's like, yeah, she is, watch, Dash is fine, she goes up to Dash, shoves the bit in his mouth, straps her around his head, put the reins on, and my daughter climbed up on Dash, took her on an Hour, took him on an hour-long trail ride, just turn and dash every which way, this big, bulky, strong animal, and she was in full control as a three-year-old kid with just some reins from the bit in his mouth. You see what James, the picture that James is painting to you, James is saying, you can do big, big things if you'll just control one thing. You can make major moves in your life. You can make major moves in your marriage. You can make major, big, exponential shifts in your life from one place to another by the words that you speak, by the things that you're agreeing to every time you open your mouth. James gives a second illustration. He says, and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. The largest, aircraft, the largest ship in the world is the U.S. aircraft carrier. It's the USS Eisenhower. Listen to this. It is 91 tons. 
It's 1,100 feet in length. It has a nuclear-powered engine that's 280,000 horsepower. It has 6,100 men and women, and it carries nearly 100 aircraft. It is bigger than a small city, and it's propelled by a rudder that is one-tenth of one percent of its size. One-tenth of one percent of its size moves the largest ship in the world. James is saying, you want to make big changes. You want to see big big things. You want to make, you want exponential power in your life. It's not about what you're doing right now. It's about what you're saying right now. What are you, what are you agreeing to every time you open your mouth in the big things and in the small things? What do you agree to? What do people push you to agree to? What are the words that are coming out of your mouth when you think of your kids? Oh, they're driving me crazy. Are you agreeing with death every time you open your mouth about them? Or are you agreeing with life that the Lord is going to help me become a better parent for these Young babies, right? Like it's, it's what, what, is, what are you saying? What are you talking about when you talk about your marriage? When you talk about your spouse? When you talk about your career? When you talk about your finance? Anything. What are you agreeing to? Because James said the most powerful thing you have to make exponential moves in your life, big moves, life-changing moves, is your mouth. The things that are coming out of your mouth. Fact number one, the tongue has exponential power. Don't underestimate the power that you have with your words. Number two, big, unbelievable, remarkable, incredible fact is this. The tongue is naturally evil. The tongue is naturally evil. Listen to James, James 3, 5 through 6. He says, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. That verse is obviously true, but I mean, you didn't even have to tell me that verse, right? Because I've got a four-year-old. Anybody else? Little kids, right? It's, it, we, I'm, I, this is so funny. One time I pulled up to his school, and uh, he's got headphones in, right? Earmuffs? Okay, great. Uh, I pulled up to his school, and I always park in the same spot, right? I park my truck there, and he comes, he looks through the glass, and then one day someone had parked in that spot, so it wasn't available, and so I had to park somewhere else, and we were, we were coming, I went and got him, we were walking out, and there was a group of moms right there, as it always is, just a great audience when your kid says something crazy, right? And so they're there, and he's walking out, and he used to pronounce truck, he had just started saying it, but T's were F's and R's were silent right? So we're like, hey, don't say that. And like, I know it's daddy's truck, but you know, just call it something else. So he comes walking up and he looks through the glass and he says, daddy, where's the? F-? And I was like, and they're all looking at me like, I'm like, hey, you get to meet his mom. She's a little out of control. Like, I don't know. You know, he may have learned that. I'm just like, oh my goodness. I said, I I'm so, and, the, and then all of them said to me, oh, don't worry about it. My kid did the same thing. One lady said, my little girl asked for a shirt in Target the other day, and she forgot the R. You know, she, hey, where is that? <laughs> it's the, so, I mean, and, but then it's, it's crazy because I talk to parents all the time, and what is the first word that your kid really learns when you ask them to do something, and they're three or they're four, and they're going to respond to you? Isn't it amazing how they don't learn? Yeah yeah, I'd love to do that. Great. I'm sure I'd be willing to help however you'd like. No, no, mine, mine, not, right? It's like, how does it, the other day he said yes, sir, to me, and I nearly started crying. I was like, Jesus, we've arrived. The time has come. He's, but it is amazing. Why? Because our mouth is part of our sinful nature, 
It's part of our sinful nature. And naturally, the tongue is evil. Naturally, it is part of my sin nature. I have, a, I have the ability to lash out, to cut, to say terrible things. And why is it that those things may come easier to my mouth than agreeing with life and agreeing with what God says and agreeing with the goodness that he says? So we learn our tongue is naturally evil, and yet James takes it further. Third fact is the tongue cannot be tamed by man. So it's really important for us to put this together. My tongue is naturally evil, and my tongue can't be tamed by me. I can't do it. James 3, 7 through 9. So what he says. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. He says you can literally teach a golden retriever to run out the front door, get the newspaper, and bring it back. He says you can teach a bird to talk back to you. You can teach a snake to curl up on your arm and not bite you. He says you can teach a dolphin to jump out of the water and catch a fish out of your hand and go back under at the sound of a whistle. But, verse 8, no one can tame the tongue. He says, you can tame all of these things, but you can't tame the tongue. It's a restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. James is saying, on our own, we can't tame our tongue. We can't get control of our mouth. It's Father's Day, and I thought this would be fun to throw the dads a bone. This is a really funny video that I want to show you. It is one of, it, he's a comedian, and he lives in Georgia, and he literally drives around, and he engages, and his name's Luke, so obviously he's really funny, right? He drives around, and he engages people in public in a conversation, and then he just loses all control of his mind, it, er, all control of his mouth. He just starts, bla it's hilarious. Uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Bear. You doing all right, Booger Bear? Good to see you, sugar. How you doing? My name's Luke. You don't remember me? You used to cut my hair. Honey, I don't never cut hair. Yes, you did, Booger Bear. <laughs> cut hair. You cut mine. Not me. I, 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 I am you not remember you told me to call you Booger Bear every time I saw you. Honey, I am not a beautician. What do you do? I just promise I, you cut I my hair. I am retired. I've never. But before I you retired, you cut my hair. Honey, I never, never in my life. I've been in the legal profession all my life. You just know somebody that looks like me. Oh my gosh, you could be her twin. <laughs> Because you I told me to call, you told you said, well, when, I, when I call, when I retire from cutting hair, you call me Booger Bear. I said, I will. And then I said, on the seven of the five and seven of the call, and then I told her, I said, well, I said, well, I'm going to see him on seven of the won't you? And I was seven of the five and seven of the seven. And then they said, well, the sheet about to have them got them hauls in the Millageville for it, so they have it making. Well, the sheet about to have us on a call if they have it in the Millageville, or is it making? Not from here. I mean, I am, but I'm not, you know. Yeah. Say that again now. I'll see the call's going to have it here. All balls going to have it <laughs> off in Macon. Well, but it's going like a shove it, dub it, or something like that. It's like a ball with the keys all. You can get the peas out, and you can get them all, and you can turn them out. You get them, you got to pile somewhere with a manager. I don't know. Something <laughs> like a strawberry uh, in Georgia and Reynolds. Are you from Reynolds? No, I'm from Millageville. Your shirt says Reynolds. My daughter lives there. What's your daughter's name? Michelle Michelle. Michelle. Spell, trucking, and tractor. The ball doesn't have any balls, Michelle Bald. Michelle? <laughs> Michelle Spell, it was Michelle Dixon. Keith Hall's going to have it a ball, they can have it at the Strawberry Festival, Bald and Reynolds. She used to be on the festival. Yeah. Too, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, have a good one. It's hot out here. How you doing, sir? I love it. Let's see if I'm going to come on down there and we're having a ball this review for the UPS. Do I need to ask them what to go to the headquarters or does I can ask you or what? Uh, just save it the phone. They can have it scrolling. They can have it set where you can have it on the phone time. You don't even know if they're going to do it or not because you have to make the delivery and hit a certain time or you're penalized. Uh -huh. So, like, how do they do it? <laughs> uh, they uh, send us an on call error. Wow. So, you, but if you are done with the things on the top of the set, top of the phone, it's going to have it out of the show blind or do they know? They have it out of the check. They just take it out. She would have going to come down to it. You could have the very wise. I'm, I'm going to see if I can do it because I do I just send the application to you. What's up with the fire's going to go down to it? Um, I hope you have a good day with St. Bible. Have a good weekend. All right. <laughs>
You know, I, that thing I set them on fall, me gonna have them. Sorry, what? I had it where I could have a set them on, and I and I said I'm just gonna run into Lowe's and ask them, but I don't know if they have it in Tifton or not. I've been, you know, I've been coming to Tifton all my life, and now, you know, they said it's the fly bit on the flood gut, and I would go into Lowe's and ask them. <laughs> the fly bed on the flood gut, if they have it in, t in Lowe's, it's a Marta shit them on the phones. And I said, you know, I don't know. They, they probably don't know if they have it or not. I don't know. You, you were asking me about it when I pulled up, though. Oh, no, I wasn't. Oh. It wasn't me. Did, when I pulled up, just saying you didn't ask me about the fly bed on the flood gut? No. You got me all confused. I thought when I pulled up, you said no. you flagged me down. No, it wasn't me. I went straight in. If it was raining, I would say, let's go dancing, but it ain't. <laughs> have a good one. Is he a nut or what? It's like, what is he even, like, what's he saying, you know? He has no, he just loses all control and just start, blah, blah, blah. That's how I started talking to Canaan when he asked me for something at the house. He said, Dad, can I have a strawberry bar? And I said, blah, 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 blah. and he gets so mad at me. It's so funny. But James, James is saying we can't tame our tongue on our own. Saying we just we may try everything, but we can't do it. Yet listen to Exodus 4, 10 through 12. This is a key verse for us and a turning point for where we're headed. It says, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Did you hear Moses just said, Hey Lord, before I met you and after I met you, I can't get my mouth right. My mouth does not say what I want it to say. Verse 11, listen to this. So the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Saying, how do I tame my tongue? How do I get my mouth under control? How do I say the things I need to say to agree with life and quit saying the things I don't need to be saying that agree with death? You submit your mouth to the Lord. You say, Lord, I submit my words to you. I submit you take over and you lead me and you speak through me and you let the Holy Spirit within me quicken me. And the moment I'm about to say something I shouldn't, would you convict me deeply? Would you speak to me deeply? And day after day after day, you submit your mouth to the Lord and he will show you what you shall say. He will teach your mouth what should come out of it. And then four, James wraps it all up, and I love how James does this every time. Fourth, unbelievable, amazing, incredible fact about the tongue. The tongue is a reflection of the heart. James takes it right back to the gospel. He said, this can fix everything, and it can make big moves in your life, and you can't tame it, but the Lord can, and at the end of the day, it's a reflection of what is going on right here. James 3, 10 through 12. He says, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble up with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Listen to Jesus. This is how Jesus phrased it. Luke 6, 43 through 45. By the way, you want a real fun Bible study on your own? Read the red letters of Jesus in your Bible and then read the book of James. Better yet, just read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, and then read the book of James. Literally almost everything James says is just drawing application to what Jesus has already said. Luke 6, 43 through 45. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. Sounds pretty familiar, right? Verse 45. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. Did you hear that? Good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Listen to what Jesus says. What you say flows from what is in your 
heart. What comes out of here is a reflection of what is in here. Don't tell me you're not an angry person if you fly off the handle every five seconds when something frustrates you. I'm not angry. I'm great. And then you explode 30 minutes later. Don't tell me you're not a jealous person if when somebody has a success, you have to tear them down or talk bad about their success or belittle them in some way because you just can't rejoice with what God is doing in them because there's something in your heart that rises. Well, yeah, they may have won that award, but we don't really know if they were accurate with what they reported, right? We don't really know if if it's what they said. Don't tell me, oh, I'm not a gossip. I don't like anybody's business. And all you do is talk. Talk about other people because Jesus is saying what is right here is reflected right here. And James takes it a step further and says, if you're going to fix this, starts with the heart. Starts with what, what is reflecting. What are you reflecting out of your mouth that is living in your heart right now? I'm not bitter at all, but I just hate that person, right? I just don't like them at all. I can't stand them. I'm not bitter, though. I'm not mad about what they did. I just, I just don't like them, right? Don't, don't say that if that's what's there. Look at the reflection. What is being reflected from my heart that's coming out of my mouth? My daughter, who is, he still got earmuffs on? She's my favorite, right? Shh, don't tell nobody. She's our family favorite. She is our favorite, and he's our best pal. And she is, uh, I, when she was a baby, we had this glass table, and then we had these, these chairs and you, you can buy these, like, harnesses that you strap to the chair that the kid sits in, right? So they sit at the table with you. And we had one of those. We used to put my daughter in it. And she loved bubble guppies. So we used to let her watch bubble guppies. And on my iPad, I, I had a bunch of bubble guppies downloaded. So we'd sit it right there in front of her at the table. And we'd give her tablet time. And she would watch bubble guppies. And she'd laugh. And she'd carry on. And so she grew up a little bit and got to a place where she was, uh, didn't have to be in the seat anymore. So she she was standing one day, and Bubble Guppies came on the TV. And when it came on the TV, she started doing this. And I was like, what the world? I mean, 23 minutes straight, full episode. She watched it like this. And I, kept, I was going over. She was like, honey, you're going to get side pain. Like I, I was trying to correct her head, and I'd literally have to, like, force her up. So she was, and every time she stopped, she'd go right back like this. I was watching, I was like, Anna, what is wrong? Like, what is she doing right now? What, what is it? Is she, does she see things upside down? She got a superpower or what? And so then she went back one day and she was sitting at the table in the chair and she was watching Bubble Guppies on my iPad. And I caught this glance of her. I looked at her and, and I saw her. And what I saw was she was looking, but she wasn't looking at the iPad. She was looking at the reflection of the iPad in the table. And she's sitting there, she's laughing. And I mean, if you just glance at her, it looks like she's watching the tablet. But what I realized is the only way she had ever learned to watch that show was upside down. And so she was sitting there watching it upside down. So when it came on the TV, it wasn't right. This was right, right? And I was, I was the whole time, I was like, what is wrong? But we just realized it wasn't anything wrong. It was just her responding to the reflection that she had learned. We ask ourselves, how do I fix what is going on in my life? How do I fix what is happening here? How do I fix what's happening here? The question is, what is being reflected from my heart that is coming out of my mouth? What is my heart reflecting in everything that I say? Because we live from the reflection of our heart. We speak from the reflection of our heart. If you're saying, I want to fix my marriage, I need to correct my heart towards my spouse, and then I need to fix the words that I speak about my marriage. I want to fix things in my family. I need to fix the reflection of my heart that sees my family in a certain way, and then I need my words to reflect what the Lord has changed in my heart. We don't tame it ourselves. The Lord tames it by transforming our heart. Hey everybody, thanks again for joining us. We believe God has something great for your life and we hope this message encourages you to take the next step in your faith. Have a great week.